Alan Turner, British paleontologist who uh, sadly passed away last year, was my companion, was the scientific half of my work for uh, many years. And uh, so now I feel like I am, you know, orphaned in a way, having lost him. So uh, I intend this also as a little tribute. Now, uh, final word about uh, digital technology. As you have seen uh, in the film, uh, I have been forced to make a transition from the early days when I would only work with uh, pencil and paper and uh, brush, uh, canvas, oil colors. Now, the work of a paleo artist needs the use of digital technology. We can divide this technology in 2D and 3D technology and it is very different because 2D technology can be seen as just another tool uh, in, the, in the graphic artist's toolbox. So I used to work with a brush, now I work with a digital tablet. It's just a matter of practice and you try to get the same to, to the same goal. 3D technology can be used as, as, a, as a tool, just like uh, the old uh, paleo artists like Charles Knight would use clay models to, to you know, uh, solve problems of proportion, lighting, uh, viewpoint. We can use digital sculpture for the same purposes. But also, 3D technology allows us to visualize fossils in new ways and to visualize the anatomy of modern animals in two ways because the CT scan sees through the external appearance of things. Now, there is a trap in here because since the machine can see what in principle we can't, it is tempting to see this as a sort of magic and we may be tempted to let the machines do the thinking for us. They cannot do that. And uh, I have a couple of, of uh, nice examples of what I mean from, from the very recent uh, uh, experience. Just as I was preparing to come uh, to Los Angeles from Madrid, uh, a, a new publication about human evolution came out. They have discovered an incredible uh, Hominid the skull in uh, Eastern Europe, in, in uh, Georgia, in Manisi, and an incredible paleo artist called Jay Maternes, an uh, 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 incredible American paleo artist, did a masterful reconstruction with the good old method. He still is 80 and something, and in perfect shape, and he still uses the good old paper and pencil. That's uh, sequential reconstruction from skeleton to muscle to external appearance was in the science web page. I invite you to take a look. It's amazing. And then I get an email from a Facebook buddy saying, have you seen this other reconstruction of, of the hominids from the humanity? And he gives me a link. I see a gorgeous 3D uh, reconstruction, digital reconstruction of one of the skulls from the Manisi with an incongruent modern nose. And uh, this same buddy uh, asked, Mauricio, don't you usually say that these creatures have flat noses? Where does this, get, this nose come from? And then I looked at the process and I read the, the artist's web page. And I see that he's using forensic um, software to automatically generate a human face on top of the bones. Forensic software is useful for reconstructing modern humans like you and me because there is a fixed relationship between the geometry of the bone and the external tissues outside. But if you want to apply that to an extinct hominid, it is like taking, say, a rubber mask, like those they use in the spy movies. Imagine a rubber mask of Brad Pitt, and you, and you try to stretch it on a gym by his skull. Essentially, <laughs> the, the, the facial features will be in the right place, but their shape is wrong. So that's one nice example.
example of saying, ah, no problem, let the, let the software do the work for me. No, you need a, a thinking person on the other side of the software to know what input we give to the software. Then we let the software do the, do the work for us. And final example is closer to my heart. I mean, I, I like to, to work in a construction of fossil communities, but I, I still have seen I love cats. So I was happy to see this article about cheetahs in a famous magazine, I think the most famous of them all. And uh, for a change, it not only had nice photographs, it had a double page spread, gorgeous, with the skeleton of the cheetah and other anatomical features showing its adaptations for mind. I actually missed that issue and a friend called my attention. Did you see that most? No. Look at this. And I look, hmm, looks gorgeous. Hmm, looks strange. Oh, looks awful. <laughs> Say gross mistakes, like having the whole, we have seen the lumbar spine of the cat, how important it is in locomotion. We anatomists get so used to how the bones are arranged. Imagine somebody takes the whole, that whole piece of the back of the animal and just turns it around. <laughs> it's shocking. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I Google that article and I find that the magazine's art department blog, and they are very proud because they have spent a lot of money scanning not one skull, the whole skeleton of the cheetah, bone by bone. They spent a lot of money. And then, when they had all the bones properly scanned, imagine I would have those files. <laughs> then they asked the intern to put them together. <laughs> the intern has no idea and no interest in cheetah anatomy, or in cat anatomy, or in any anatomy. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so, my final word is, uh, okay, we may, uh, Love, we are in love with technology. Uh, we have all these gadgets, but uh, let us use them to help us, but let us not uh, leave the thinking to them. And if any of you is considering to, 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 to do paleo art, remember that the important thing that is going to, to, to take you to enjoy yourself and to, and to find really interesting things is to love what you do. And uh, if you are working in dinosaurs or, or, or in fossil mammals, the important thing is that you love your subject. Then you will find the technique that is more, that suits you better, but uh, the art is not an end. It is a means. It's your means to discover more about the world around you. And then I suppose you will become a, a, a convinced conservationist, I myself, because you know, if you, if you open your eyes and, and look around, I, I had this uh, mm, workshop about drawing the big cats in Africa two months ago, and uh, it was a, a small group of artists, and uh, even myself, just having the cat in front of you, and then we share a lesson on, on cat anatomy, and the next day we see it with renewed eyes. And it's like, you know, it gives you the goosebumps to, to, to think what's happening inside that animal. It is beautiful to start with, but if you have an inkling of what is going on inside that, that whole machinery, God, it becomes truly amazing. So, uh, I'm yeah, fortunate to, to, to be able to work in this, even if it's not well paid or <laughs> anything. So, uh, I truly uh, would uh, uh, encourage any young person who, who wants to become a paleo artist, uh, please join us. And uh, for the rest, uh, I hope uh, we are offering you something new to enjoy. So, thank you very much. And I will be uh, signing uh, books. Back there in the table, the idea was to sign uh, copies of my new favorite book.
sorry, they didn't get in time from China. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to sell my, my, okay, my older book instead. And uh, look uh, forward, uh, look out for the new uh, book being available in like a week from or two weeks from now uh, in the internet. So thank you, thank you very much. I do. Yeah. It, it, it seems like some of the older saber-toothed cats have a longer face than their modern counterparts. Is that so, that their face is longer, it seems? Yes. Yes. Actually, it, it's not so much the, the teeth as the roots. The roots of, of the canine uh, tooth, the canine teeth, uh, need room in the, in the maxilla yeah. of the animal. But then on top of that, many saber -tooth develop big incisor uh, teeth so that they can help in the biting mechanism right. to, to, to prevent breakage, also to take the meat from the carcass so that adds even more to the length of the, of the face. Yes. And then on top of that, the face is like turned upwards. Or maybe it's the back of the skull that turns upwards, but the, the dorsal outline of the whole head is straighter, more straight. Mm -hmm. So the result looks like a really long face. So there's a, an, an anatomical basis for very looking longer uh, faces. Mm. Okay. Yeah, so compared to modern cats, uh, many of the things that are seeing somewhat laterally in cats, are probably not the proportion of the cats that are in the So what do you think? Where are the bottom of the animal? Can you uh, a little bit louder? Oh, sorry. We, uh, compared to looking at the smaller model, 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 and necessary muscle, not so much to have a strong back, but also to, to sustain that, that back. They, they need to like, like asphyxiate their prey or whatever, so that, that benefits from bigger mass and bigger cross section, so that the, uh, the, this part of, of the face, which is around the, the mass of, of the muscle, must become broken. In saber tooth cats, what they essentially have to do is to pierce the, the flesh until they cause enough damage, essentially or largely blood loss. So that would happen rather quickly. And they don't need to, to spend like a quarter of an hour like oh, keeping that strength. So they can do with less muscle mass. Also they have the muscles of the neck of the neck to help them drive the sabers into the flesh of prey so that it makes the work of, of the jaw muscles better. So there's an additional reason why they can uh, do without too much muscle mass. The smaller the muscle mass, the narrower the scalp. So that's essentially what's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. um, for, uh, I guess, like the art aspect of it, do you uh, use like, I'm assuming you use like Photoshop for like the 2D uh, art, but for like the 3D stuff, like what type of programs do you do, do you use or for the artist that does that and uh, do you also do like the animation and yeah. stuff like that yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah as you say, yeah, I stick to Photoshop for, for the 2D and for the 3D, uh, you know, in Spain, most 3D artists use 3D Studio Max, okay. which is probably not the best for character animation. I think Maya is this way uh, better developed in that sense. Uh -huh. But if you want to, to, to collaborate with people, then you better stick to 3D Studio Max, at least if you're working in Spain. It's not nearly optimal. Especially when it comes to rendering hair and that sort of thing, 
pretty soon you'll have abandoned their, 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 their users because they are all into uh, you know, architectural uh, 3D. Yeah. So yes, I do. I model the, the skeletons because I don't want to, to leave anyone else to do that anatomical part. Yeah. And I model the, the animals, mm -hmm. but then I need it to, to be animators to read in most cases to read the character so that they can move with the virtual bones inside yeah. and to do the animation but always I am testing them I mean I'm, I'm uh, there with them for every uh, step of the process yeah. uh, especially regarding locomotion and checking that when, when the 3D model is fully read to see that the motions are fluid and, and that the, the muscles deform you know, so uh, I tend to be on top of the whole thing, but uh, it would be too much for me to try to do the animation stuff. So. Yeah, and uh, in your book, you also have the Sinodonts and Gorgonopsids, which are somewhere saber tooth. Is the gap that big between the Permian saber tooth animals and the cats? Is that anything in between that was saber tooth? Does it kind of start there and begin again with the cats? Sorry, sorry, can you. Yeah, oh. yeah we're asking about the. Yeah, the, 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 there were sort of. Saber tooth animals during the Permian era. Yeah. Is the gap that large between the Permian era and then the cats? Were there any saber tooth animals in between the cats and the Permian? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There, are, there is a big gap because that if we would define saber tooth only by the shape of, the, of their teeth, we could include several kinds of dinosaurs. We have that, that sort of flattened, uh, curved, and serrated uh, teeth. But those teeth are, are used in such a different uh, functional environment that we cannot call these animals. So we have something saber tooth like in the Permian way before the dinosaurs. And uh, they get extinct together with everything else, almost everything else in the crisis at the end of the Permian. And then there's nothing saber tooth around until the beginning of the tertiary. And then we have uh, saber tooth animals, which were there way before the cats. It was in the Eocene pe period, and these animals were creodonts, which were like a family of, of mammals, related to carnivores, but not to carnivores, and they did the first experiment of developing the, 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 the saber tooth model. Some, some of them were not tolerated than your uh, house cat. So they wouldn't be killing uh, any sort of gigantic animals. Yeah. Only animals larger than themselves enough to justify this sort of, you know, uh, living uh, to this method. Then there came the new rabbit saber tooth, closer relatives of the cats. In South America, in, in complete and splendid, as I say, isolation, the marsupials developed their own uh, saber tooth. Uh, the, their own version of the saber tooth model. So uh, during the whole tertiary, which is say that the last uh, of the saber tooth period would be from 50 million years ago or something like that, to yesterday, I mean the Rancho La Brea era, 10,000 years ago, there have always been uh, some sort of, of uh, saber tooth predators around, or all nearly all. I think you all agree that you've been absolutely fascinating. So, once again, thank you very much. Thank you.